four weeks, we're going to be camping with Moses. Uh, but we're not starting right at the beginning. So uh, to fill in the gaps, I want you to tell me, what do you know about Moses from the first chapters of his life? What comes first? Baby, baby. baby in, a, in a what? In a river. In a river. Passed in a river. And, and Moses' name in Hebrew means drawn out. So it kind of has a connection there. What else do we know about Moses' early years? Raised by, uh, by Egyptians, by royalty. So he went from being uh, the son of a slave, basically, to being royalty. What else do we know about him as he grows up? Yes, he had this sense of justice. When he, he, somehow, something, even though he was raised in the lap of luxury, he felt there were things in the world that were right and wrong, and he saw some things that were wrong, and so he, he had a bad temper. Um, apparently what was going on was the government was, they had said to all the workers, you have to do X amount of work. And uh, we'll give you the straw so you can do the work. And then the government said, actually, we want now we want you to go get the straw and do the same amount of work for the same amount of pay. And they started beating the people. And Moses said, that's not right. So he killed, he killed a man and then he ran away. And what happens next when he runs away? A Eventually. Next week is wandering. Next week is wandering. <laughs> Eventually, that's, that's, that's coming up in, in a couple weeks. Um, but uh, before we even get to the burning bush, he has to marry a woman, and he, he ends up with this great father-in-law, uh, and he starts to be a shepherd. Now, Moses, we don't know how old Moses is at, this, at the point when he first goes down there. Maybe he's in his 20s because he's so angry at the world and he's getting back at it by running away. That makes sense in the 20s. Maybe he's in his 40s because later in the story it does say he's 43 when he talks to the Pharaoh. I don't know, somewhere in there, 20s to 40s. Let's split the difference and say Moses is about my age. And at my age, imagine... If you had, at my age, been through the lap of luxury and had the world on a platter, and now you're a shepherd? If you've been here for uh, Christmas Eve, I tend to tell the children about the, the shepherds in the story. That Often in your, in your nativity scenes, they have beards. They didn't have beards. The people who watched the sheep were all 8 to 12 years old. Maybe 14 if they were really rambunctious and they just never built their way up. So the fact that Moses is with the sheep out on the field means he's doing the job of a 12-year-old to earn his stripes with his new father-in-law. What a fall from grace. And so before this burning bush incident, we have a man who is split between his present reality that's really hard to accept and a past of luxury that had some pain but had so much opportunity. And if you look back to his past, he was split between a family that he barely knew but he clearly cared about and an adopted family who gave him everything they could, but somehow he knew it didn't define everything about him. Can anyone identify with those splits in your life? Did anyone ever have a childhood torn in two directions? Did anyone ever feel the need to just get away and run away? Has anyone ever done something in their life that just haunts your past and maybe tries to separate you from your own past? Or do you feel stuck in a life now that you didn't expect, you didn't plan, you never wanted? I was going to be a prince, but now I'm poor. I had a family. I had two families, but now I'm making the best I can with these new people in a strange land. I had dreams in my life, but they're gone. And every day I can't forget what went wrong, what I did wrong, what others did to me. And every day I can't even imagine what I could do to get it all right again. Does that sound familiar? A little familiar? Too familiar? We know something about what Moses feels in this story. And regardless if you had a family dynamic like him, regardless if you fell from riches to poverty, or if you killed someone for injustice, I hope not, maybe you just protested. But, but we all know something about his disillusionment. You know what it's like at one point or another in your life to have no direction? You know what it's like to wonder, what am I doing here? What's the point of all this? Am I living the best life I can? Am I doing everything I can for me and for the world? You know what that's like. And if you've forgotten, listen today in case that feeling comes back or in case someone that you love falls into a place where they need a burning bush to point them back to a future of hope. And here's the thing. For most of us, if you know what it's like to be in that dark valley, you also know, even a little bit, what it's like to have a flash of inspiration. On the one hand, you know what it's like to be numb, and on the other hand, what it's like to have an idea, uh, a smile, some warmth that comes out of nowhere. 
You know what it's like to be treated cold for so long and then run into kindness? You know what it's like to be overwhelmed and stressed and helpless and then to finish your work, to cry those cleansing tears, maybe to wake finally from restful sleep. You know what it's like to have every door close in your face and then, almost like an accident, something swings open and touches your heart. Somewhere, you are reminded that there is beauty in the world. We've all been Moses at the bottom, and we've all seen a burning bush breaking through the darkness, pointing us somewhere. And so what's next? If we have been lost for so long, and we get this hint of guidance, do you just snap out of it? Push away all the baggage and pain and negative patterns of your life? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps? Or, more likely, I speak for myself, I have this tendency when I'm living in a pattern, no matter positive or negative, when I get used to a way of life and there's some other way to live, I'm probably going to fight against that. I'm going to resist that in some way. Because I have this tendency, and maybe you do too, that when you're in these ruts of melancholy and cynicism, I almost get addicted to that. Addicted or just so used to the feeling uh, that if I've been stuck long enough, it almost feels safer to be miserable with what I know than to step out into some dangerous unknown where, God forbid, I might fail at it. Or, God forbid, I might succeed. Or, I might have to rely on someone else's help. Or, even worse, I might have to rely on a world that has hurt me over and over and over and finally trust that it might heal. No thanks, burning bush. You make a good case, but I'm just fine where I am. Really, I'm strong enough. I, I can put up with anything. It's not really that bad. This isn't what I expected living down in Midian, but it's not so bad. And I don't even know what you're going to do with my life. Even if it's a good thing, I'm just not sure I have it in me. I'm getting older, you know. So we come up with excuses. We come up with rationalizations. We come up with all those reasons we just assume not face our past or the future. We come up with all these reasons why these problems we're dealing with, they're not that bad, as long as I don't have to step into an unknown. Moses, at this very point of his life, is adrift in chaos, made partly by the world's circumstances, partly by his own fault. And this vision of fulfillment and purpose starts to flicker in his mind and his heart, and he resists as much as he can. And all of us, in big and small ways, we have been adrift in our own chaos. And all of us, in, in bright or, or less bright ways, have had something that shines into us. And all of us, I presume, at one point or another, have struggled to make the changes that life invites us to make. And I get it. It can be so hard to trust that. If we've done, if we've done so much wrong for so long, why would we trust that we can ever get it right? And if we wonder, has God caused or somehow been part of this negative situation, why would we trust God to get us out of that? So whether we are dealing with addiction or anger or depression or poor health, or whether we've made so many mistakes in our relationships and our finances, whether we've hurt people or been hurt by others, whether we can't figure out how in the world our lives could ever matter, whatever brings us to Moses' mountain of despair, and however God gets your attention, how do we overcome that hesitation? spiritually and in just regular life? How do we step toward redemption, toward meaning, towards a whole, holy life? How do we convince ourselves that something has to change or nothing ever will? From the text, and I'm going to use a slightly different translation um, for part of this, but let's look a little closer in to some of the specific words that the text brings us to. Uh, The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush. And he looked, Moses looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. And then Moses said, this is the uh, New Revised Translation, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, here I am, all that stuff. Um, I don't know if Moses' home anxieties were following him up the trail. Was his marriage healthy, this awkward, shotgunny marriage down in a strange land? Maybe. How did he feel about Jethro, his father-in-law, who very well could have been about the same age as he was? Uh, we don't know. How did he feel about shepherding, the actual job of shepherding? Relaxing? Taxing? 
probably not at his age to start all over. And maybe he was thinking about all those things, walking along a mountain. Does anyone else do that when you're hiking? Finally, I can get away from everything. Finally, there's some peace. Finally, some silence. Finally, and that tape just keeps running in your head. Where did that thought come from? Why am I thinking about that out here? I, can get, I need to get that out of my mind. Why do these worries follow me? I can't get away from the things I need to get away from, the things I did, the things I said, I could have said. Even hiking in the mountains, sometimes these problems just follow us. Or maybe Moses is walking along there, not thinking at all about his problems of today, but daydreaming about the good old days, the chariot races, the goblets of wine. Maybe he was wondering where his mother was. Now that I'm older, I understand she had to push me out in that basket. I understand that, but it still hurts. Maybe he was wondering whether he could have been a good prince. Would he have had the power in in himself and in the world to change the system? Maybe he was just fixated on all the woulda, coulda, shoulda beens in his life. And either way, in that moment, something caught his attention. I don't really care if it was a literal burning bush or a metaphorical flash that broke through his whirlpool of sadness, but at that moment, he saw something. And what did Moses do in response? I must turn away from all the things that have been on my mind in order to turn toward the freedom and joy that waits at the center of our being. In order to look on what could be a new life, he had to turn away from his daily concerns, his common worries, his patterns of negativity. He turned away from relying on his own strength. He turned away from everything he knew because only by doing that could he turn toward new inspiration and sacred guidance. His heart had been covered in a shadow for so long. And now God, whether God put that bush burning there forever or put it just burning right now, only when Moses decided to turn away from what wasn't working could he turn toward anything God could possibly want for his life. So next in the text, God reaches out, Moses responds, and then when, when God sees Moses' attention, that is precisely when God calls out, Moses, Moses. And that's when, God, when Moses can respond, here I am. It was initially this little dance of awareness, but next we have mutual action. We have opportunity and calling. We have named, we have an answer. And again, I don't know if the story happens exactly like this or if this is like Jesus' parable meant for all of us for all time, but the way it's written, this is not describing anything supernatural. This is describing the most normal interplay between our feelings of aimlessness and our first hints of purpose in our life. When your life has no direction, when it's so hard to get out of bed, when it's so difficult to face the most normal challenges of being an adult, It's just unfair for someone to snap their fingers and say, get out of that. And if you've ever been truly depressed, you know intimately that you can't just say, I went to bed sad and someone told me to wake up happy and so here I am, happy, ready for the world. It just doesn't work that way. Whatever it is about the way the world is set up and the way our hearts fall fall down through that, our awakening, any awakening, happens in stages and steps. Whatever joy and potential breaks in, so unexpectedly, whatever joy and potential breaks into our lives, it takes engagement slowly to get back onto a path of healing and meaning. Which is not to say God can't just zap somebody into restoration. I've heard stories like that. Maybe it's happened to me once or twice, but usually it's a partnership between the best of you that's reaching up and the best of heaven that is reaching down into our mundane lives. And however it is we partner with the source of our very being, that is when we get the real strength and the freedom to live the way we're called to live. Third thing from the text, and then we'll we'll sit down and sing some more songs about campfires. It's one thing to have a relationship with the source and value of the whole universe itself. That's spiritual and mystical and mysterious and cosmic and eternal. Uh, But it's totally another thing to have a relationship with your little brother. Little brothers are um, often all-encompassing and painful and can be a little obnoxious. How many of you are little brothers? Okay, yeah, yeah. How many of you have little brothers? Yeah, okay, we're kind of split in that. After Moses makes all the excuses he can think of, and those never work with God, 
He made all the excuses he could, and eventually, no matter how alone he felt, the truth comes out that we are never alone. We are never without some community of support. We are never called to things alone. People say God will never give us anything too hard to handle. I, I don't believe that. God has given me plenty of things that I personally can't handle. But God never gives us more than we can handle together. And we never get there without some kind of relationship of shared work and shared service. We do not get anywhere, even on our most personal path, without aligning to the hope that runs through all creation. We do not get anywhere without taking part in the love that exists between all parts of creation. And if we have the courage to follow that light out of the darkness, we might have the courage to keep following it on a hike. May we have the courage to get on a trail toward a new life promised and hopeful. May we have the courage for God to lead us out of disorientation. and May we trust that we are pointed on a path of redemption and renewal. Amen.